Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Hina, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Fantastic, my friend. We're still waiting for Denny. Hey, I'm here. Denny, what? Yeah, see? When did you, when, how did you sneak in? Yeah, I, <laughs> I heard that you are talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> I have talked about you more than I've talked about yourself this week. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm so excited for, listen, I mean, I, if I can only count the number of people I have told your story to, just like, the sheer resilience in that story, you know, I mean, EB1 and strategies are the cherry on the cake, but the, the real uh, power in your story is your journey. How do you talk it out? My goodness. Yeah, yeah, I, I made a PowerPoint and thanks for sending over that one that helped me. Of and uh, so I think um, I, I will, I focus more on my journey as well as on uh, what are the uh, different type of visas and what are the catches of different type of visas and uh, uh, how we can navigate all this and their system um, staying sane. So, <laughs> so that's my goal here. That's awesome. uh, so can we get started? We are going to take like a couple minutes. Uh, Danny, okay. people yeah. like they are just like trickling in right now yes, so yes. i want to make sure that as many people uh get that opportunity to listen to you um denny quickly mm -hmm. i are you is it do you think 30 minutes is enough for you i think so yeah yeah okay. we'll see yeah 30 minutes is enough so i prepared just uh, four or five slides i will go okay. through that so that's perfect that's uh, perfect. yeah i you know i also want to focus on you know how others can learn from my stuff rather than just listening to the story of my it's all of course it is an interesting story but uh, i want others uh, the the audience they want to take something from this meeting that they can apply in their uh, mm. journey absolutely no i mean i if, if we are gonna i'm gonna make this announcement as well that you know we're gonna keep the last 30 minutes solid 30 minutes for folks to be able to interact with you one on one but where are you right now are you in uh, jersey yes yeah i'm in new york new york new jersey yes anybody in the east coast anybody from the west coast that's early for you anybody from hawaii that's like midnight for you right now <laughs> where are people logging in from mm -hmm. Anyone it? from West Coast here? California. Yeah, Sham is here from California. New York. Poonam. Poonam is a Poonam is Poonam is a depression lawyer. <laughs> Poonam is like I'm just gonna sneak in and like see what 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 is this about? Poonam, hi. No sneaking. Just fascinated by all the stories, and <laughs> it's just so interesting to hear all these amazing people. Yeah. So happy to be here congratulations denny and Thank excited you. to hear about your journey yeah thanks for being here poonam i mean poonam is i was so happy seeing poonam because first of all i was happy hearing poonam because you see you see lawyers who look like us but they have an american accent which shows that they're from america they're you're born and raised here but poonam mm -hmm. is like an og she's from india and uh, she that was that was very relatable to see somebody who was born in India, then moved to the US, had a flavor of immigration and now is representing us on the other side. So it's always nice to see that. That's great. Yeah, we need more lawyers like her and I people swear. like you, Aditi, that uh, you are doing a great job, you know, bringing everyone together, uh, you know, feeling kind of comfortable uh, to talk to you. You are a good listener, as I told. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Of course, thank you, thank you, Paul. Northern New York. What? 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 What is Northern New York? Wyoming. Bhau Sahib, are you the only Indian in Wyoming? I need to know this. Bhau Sahib. Hello. Yeah. yeah. 
I am I the only one right now. <laughs> 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 no, I, what I didn't know, uh, which I got to know from one of my mentees is I, I have seen enough Instagram uh, like reels and I swear after this we're going to start that there are a lot of Indians in uh, Dallas. And uh, yes. he, uh, he said, Aditi, Dallas is actually called Dallas Puram. <laughs> <laughs> which i found to be so funny i'm like my gosh yeah we need we need like listen we i'm gonna take as many indians in the u.s as, as possible but the main indian in the room today with us is uh, dr denny arapattu um i got to know denny through the comment section on linkedin as i find people uh, mm -hmm. and uh, i reached out to denny and uh, i asked him about his journey and man what i heard left me so fascinated and talk about the the spirit of human resilience like what what it takes to survive um, i i hope you take notes for that i know you're here to crack the eb1 but eb1 is as much about strategy as it is about your perseverance about your attitude toward life and i hope you get that from denny's story today so denny um without keeping folks away from uh what you have to share i'm going to give you the floor uh a quick um house house rules please mute yourself as jenny is talking and jenny is going to go from 1205 right now for the next 30 minutes he's going to share his story give you some strategies and then we are going to jump right into q a where you're going to have an opportunity to ask denny questions one on one okay but till then keep your uh mics on mute and we are going to go ahead and get started denny it's all you uh, thank you, Aditi. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. And I want to congratulate uh, you for uh, reaching 30K on LinkedIn. And uh, uh, it's a, a big step ahead. Uh, so, uh, folks, please congratulate uh, uh, Aditi for reaching that uh, uh, big step. Uh, so, let's jump into uh, some of the stuff. What I went through, I'm going to share the screen and I will present uh, like a few slides. Uh, then we can go from there. Hello. Can you see my screen? No, we, we can't yet, uh, Danny. Oh, yes. now we can. Now we can. Do you want to put it on like slideshow mode? Yes. Yeah, I'll do that. Awesome. Thank you, Krishna. Okay, um, so, you know, I went through J1, H1B cap exempt, O1, then all the way to the EB1 to get the green card. So this is a puzzle. So I invite all of you to join me uh, to solve this puzzle together. Um, so J1 visa waiver, let's start with J1 visa. So I came to the United States with a J1 visa. So J1 visa, uh, it's a good one, you know, you can come as a postdoc and one advantage of J-1 visa is that your spouse can get an EAD. So both of you can work, but you know, there is a catch with that. There is a two year, like get your ass back in the house type of condition. Once you finish your J-1 visa waiver, you need to go back to uh, your home country and you have to stay there for two years before you can ever reach or you can ever come back to the United States. That's a big problem that you know, most of us don't know whether such a condition is there or not. You know, when we get a postdoc, uh, you know, position in the United States, we get excited and we will take our, we'll pack our bags and we come there, come here. Then after that only we will start like uh, what I will do next. My J1 is going to end in next couple of years. I may get a one more year extension or two more year extension. What is after that? So that is a big question that poses all of us who are in the J1 visa. Uh, so that's where this J1 visa waiver comes into play. Then uh, do we need this J1 visa waiver for the green card processing? Yes, we want this green uh, J1 visa waiver also for this green card or the EB1, EB2, whichever way you are going, we also require uh, 
uh, this J1 visa waiver. But it is not required for the initial stages. It's required only for before filing the I-485. I-485 is the adjustment of status, that your status is moving from visa or a non-immigrant to an immigrant status or to a permanent resident status. So that is when you require this waiver. So why I filed a, a J-1 visa waiver? So I want, you know, my same case, I came here in the J-1 visa, then my two years is going to complete. I can get a third year extension, but I'm not sure about my fourth year extension. At the same time, I was also working on my green card. Um, so uh, I want to continue here. So if I want to continue here, I want to move to another visa category. So at that time, I had no idea what is going to happen, but I thought that I will get this J-1 visa waiver and keep it with me. If something works out, let it work out. Otherwise, I will go back to India. That was my strategy. And I also heard from some of uh, other people who went through the same route that getting this J-1 visa waiver, it take a lot of time. It's a three-step process. So any of you want to know, I don't know how, how much it changed, but if any of you want to know that how it went for me, uh, you know, we can set up in another meeting. I, I'm not going to uh, to the much details of this J-1 visa waiver processing. So, uh, so that was my idea. So at that time, it was kind of an open-ended problem. Uh, uh, whether I'm going to continue in the US, I have no idea. Whether I'm going to get the green card before uh, my J-1 ends, I don't know. But I, I went for this J-1 visa waiver and keep it handy. If something happens, I can use that and I can move to another H-1B or some other category. So that's, what, that's the only idea uh, for me. So what is the catch? There is a catch for J-1 visa waiver. So that you have to be very well aware of before you jumping into your J-1 visa waiver. You know, once you extend, uh, you know, this J-1, you know, once you get this J-1 visa waiver or you filed for the J-1 waiver, then you cannot extend your J-1 visa normally. So that is the problem. So, you know, you apply for the J-1 waiver and uh, something similar happened for me that I applied for this J-1 waiver and things were processing. Uh, I think I got this J-1 waiver. At that time, uh, you know, something happened in my family, an emergency happened. I had no other option. I had to travel to India. Then I went there. Uh, then, you know, I went, at that time, my two-year visa stamp was over. I was on DS-2019. There is no stamp, visa stamp in my uh, passport. I went to stamp my visa in the U.S. consulate in Chennai. Um, they denied. They told them you are not going to get the visa anymore. So I was kind of stuck in the U.S. I had uh, all my stuff back in the U.S. Uh, I stuck in India. I know where to come back. Uh, all my apartment, everything is here. So it was kind of what I will do. I have no other job. I started searching for a job in India. So finally, I don't know what happened. Some of my uh, my advisor here, as well as, uh, you know, I was working for the Navy, U United States Navy at that time. Some folks from the United States Navy, they pushed something. So I don't know what happened. It is still a mystery, but I got an email from the uh, consulate that to come back. So I went back with my passport. Uh, they uh, accepted my passport. Then I got visa stamped. So it happened for me, but it usually what I learned is that it will not work. But if you get a waiver, then that's it. You will not get an extension. So um, as I mentioned, it is a multi-step process. It takes uh, time. So you have to be well planned, well, uh, you know, do your homework as, you are, as well as the timing is very important. So going back to your visit your home, it's kind of a no. So forget about it. Once you get this thing done, then you have to wait uh, for an another move to another visa category. So being a researcher or a postdoc in a university, the best thing is once you get the J-1 visa waiver, you move to the H-1B, CAP exempted. This is for the non-profit uh, organizations like universities or laboratories. So if you are a researcher, this is your best bet go for H-1B cap exempted. So it will be good 
you know, once you land in the United States, you start working on the J-1 visa. Most of the folks in the United States, they don't know what we are going through. So we have to educate them. You have to talk to your advisor. Uh, this is the issue. We have this, this problems. So if you want me to continue here, what is our long-term plan? Can I get an H-1P cap exempted? That is the only option for me. If that is the stage and condition, I can apply for a J-1 visa waiver. So we need to talk to them. You know why I didn't do that. I didn't do that. That when I think retrospectively, that was a mistake. So why I am telling all this is that you know I did the mistake. You guys really don't want to go through the same mistake. So talk to your advisor. Most of them don't know what is even a visa is. They don't know whether we want to go to US consulate for an interview. They don't know. So this is all our pain. So we need to talk to our advisor that what is happening in our world. So next time coming to the EB1 national interest waiver self petition case. So this was a, a kind of coincidence. Uh, I never I, I planned to apply for a green card. Uh, so because there are some obligations I have to finish in my family back in India. So I had no plan to continue here in the U United States. Uh, but uh, one day I met a professor, his postdoc, he's from, from Brazil. I, so this professor told me that uh, his postdoc is from Brazil. He got a, a EB2. Um, so I talked with this particular postdoc. So he told that it is very comparatively very easy. Uh, you, of course, you need to uh, get a lot of paperwork done. So he told he started his work in September 2022 and got his green card in August 2013. So it's about a year of work. So I thought, okay, if this is so easy, then give a shot. Uh, it's a green card. If I want to continue here, I can continue here. If I want to go back to India, I can do that also. So that was my idea. Um, so that's when I contacted uh, the attorney, same attorney, this particular Brazil person uh, worked with. So uh, I got a nearly different answer. It's a kind of pain in the butt kind of answer I got. Uh, so, uh, so you know, he gave, he he write, wrote me back that, you know, uh, EB2 for Indians, it will, it is a wait of nine months. EB1A is the best bet for you. So I wrote him back that, you know, there is a typo in your email. It looks like, uh, uh, you know, you, you wrote nine years, but it looks like uh, it, for the, it might be nine months. So he wrote me back again that, no, Denny, this is for Indians and Chinese people. It is nine years and more, uh, the wait time for the EB2. So you don't go through this EB2, you try EB1. So I started processing, you know, first I conducted in February 2014 and I got the green card finally in May 2021. It's a long seven years and this is the breakdown. So this is the timeline and in the, uh, you know, immigration <laughs> circles, it is also known as emotional roller coaster. So I am this guy here, uh, the group and, you know, my kids, they enjoy the stay and, uh, you know, life in the US, but I was like this all these seven years. Um, so, uh, so how all this happened is that in 2024, I mean, 2014, I contacted the attorney. Then June 2015, I first submitted for my I-140 uh, filing. October 2050, I got, uh, you know, notice for further evidence from the USCIS. I gave all these stuff, but in 2016, USCS denied my application, stating that uh, I'm not in that uh, top category whom, whom they can give this EB1A. So my attorney told that there is, uh, you know, this is, might be the problem with that particular officer. We can, of course, uh, uh, you know, appeal for, uh, file an appeal. Uh, but uh, when I talked with uh, some of other people, they told, you know, it might not be a good idea. So what I did that, uh, so that's when I started working on my profile. So this was all based on whatever I did already. I have my publications, I have all my stuffs, uh, citations, my journal reviews, things like that. But when this got denied, uh, that's when I did a little more research. So that's when I started building. So I had some papers in my pipeline 
So I worked on that. I published that. That's, uh, of course, my job. I had to do that. So uh, I completed that uh, because in 2012, I joined. I worked all these uh, three, four years. So I had so many works in pending. So I completed that and started publishing sometime in 2015. So all those publications started coming out. So I waited for that. And second thing what I did is I um, I started uh, you know reviewing more and more publications. I contacted uh, some of the general uh, organizations and uh, I registered myself as the reviewer. So that gave me uh, more and more publications to review. So that is a good strategy. You know, you can uh, register yourself as a reviewer in many of these uh, journal or the publications like uh, American Geophysical Union and uh, MDPA, uh, things like uh, publications like that or publishers like that. Uh, you can register as a reviewer and on top of that uh, i also got the opportunity to become a guest editor of the journal atmosphere published by the uh, mdpa and i also became a uh, editor for the journal remote sensing the same publisher so those all helped me to review more and more works of the others so these all accumulated then um, then what else? Uh, I yeah, so I have more publications. Now I have more uh, judging of work of others. And I also some of my works when I published, I I talk to my advisor and I will get it published uh, in newsletters in my university. So that is also helped. So uh, so all these things accumulated and finally I refiled in 2018, uh, May 2018. And December 2018, I get it approved. And uh, um, you know, that time it was in another problem. When, when in 2015, uh, it was current. There, there is no backlog for the EB1A. But by the time it reached 2018, there was a backlog. There is a long backlog. So even though I got my I-140 approved, I could not file this I-485 for the adjustment of status. For that, I had to wait a long period, like about two years. December 2018, 2018, I have approved. And in October 2020, I submitted I-485. Uh, so this is the only good thing that happened during the COVID uh, for me. Um, so rest of the things, as you know, we all were suffering during the COVID times. So, and another thing I want to tell you that I never went to India after 2015. So till I went to India, then back in 2022. So um, these many years, you know, emotionally, when I think I lost a lot of uh, uh, family things, um, you know, family gatherings back in India, things like that. So it was really an emotional roller coaster. One day you will feel that, okay, things are working. And the next day you will find that nothing is working. So it, it can happen. So that's what I'm, I want you to take from here, from this timeline. It is not that I got the EB1A. It is the emotional roller coaster that you are going through or you will be going through when you are in this process. You know, every day is going to be different. One day you will feel that, okay, things are going to work. So everything is, I, all the stars are aligned. But the next day you will see that nothing is working. Oh my God, this is entirely, uh, you know, BS. Uh, I want to stop it. So you will feel that. But, you know, next day you again get up and uh, do the same thing. You will keep push, pushing and pushing, uh, you know, the envelope of uh, whatever you did a little bit to the next day. So that way you keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, and uh, definitely you will reach the. Uh, so you have to be aware of that part of the uh, problem. Um, it is not straightforward. It is. It takes lot of your uh, family time it can take uh, a lot of your emotional uh, strength things like that then uh, coming back here to the timeline so may 2021 finally in october 2021 2020 the backlog my uh, you know the visa date or the priority date became uh, my priority date december 28 so then i filed I got just a one month, October 2020, when this thing reached. Then there is another set of papers 
uh, you have to collect all these vaccination report, things like that. A lot of other stuff you have to gather. So that was again, October 2020 was like a rush time. We did everything. Uh, we get all the paperwork done, then submitted. Um, then another thing I want to t add with this is that at that time, I also, my job got hit by the COVID. So uh, I was like going again, going back to India. Like uh, if I didn't get the uh, green card before December, I got uh, an ultimatum. Like the company told me that I can, we can support you till, uh, you know, August, August uh, 2021. If you didn't get your green card before August 2021, we cannot support you. That's the kind of uh, ultimatum I got from my company. So fortunately, in May 2021, I got the green card uh, about uh, two uh, two months before this ultimatum. Uh, then, then that opened a lot of possibilities. So that's another point I want you to take from here. Green card opens up a lot of possibilities. You can work in the US. You can get uh, opportunities. You can grow. So this will. This is just like a before and after type of situation. Before green card and after green card. Before green card, you will not get any job. You know, it, I will come to that in the next slide. So I'm going to conclude this slide with you know what it took. Like it took seven plus years and four narrow escapes that you know four times i narrowed escape the uses uh, hammer that uh, i should you know first time i went to india then second time my j1 waiver then third time an h1b then fourth time an o1 then uh, like that so i four times i narrowly escaped uh, from going back to india then countless sleepless nights um, so this was my legal criteria used for an EB1. This is a question I often get from several of you folks. That's uh, what is the criteria used? So these are the three criteria mainly used: made original scientific contributions of major significance in the field. Uh, so this they met using all the um, you know reference letters, recommendation letters, as well as my uh, publications and citations and how my publications are used by other people in the field then a second thing is the same thing but in a different way or that scholarly articles in the field in professional or major trade publications or other major media and uh, has participated as a judge so this is another thing this is very important and this is something that as a researchers and postdocs we can meet uh, that others cannot meet like participated as judge of the work of others in the same or allied field. So become a reviewer, become guest editors, or become editors of the journals, that counts. So that is one thing we can easily do if we put a little bit effort. Then in addition to meeting at least these three categories, uh, the attorney also used uh, this, uh, then he, Dr. Alapatu is an individual who has achieved a level of expertise indicating that he is one of the small percentage of who has risen to the very top of the field. So this is the one thing that, uh, uh, you know, USES first denied, they, that this is the thing they cited. He is not in the small percentage of people. So that's one reason they denied it uh, in the first hand, in, in my first filing. Uh, then this is another one. Uh, they justified my future stay will substantially benefit the prospectivity, prospectivity for the United States. So these are the criteria used for the application of the EB1. Uh, <clears throat> then this comes, uh, you know, the academia to industry. So uh, even though it is an academia to industry for uh, immigrants, it is an another visa journey. So uh, you you know I had no idea that this H-1B cap exempt is different from the H-1B used by the industry. So I was thinking like why I am not getting a job in the industry. So uh, as I told you know I got my I-140 applied in approved in 2018, but I could not file I-485 because of the backlog. So that took a long time. I explained that. So by this time you know my idea that I thought that I may great researcher i still think that i'm a great researcher so my i i wanted to get a job in academia so i tried all my level best if you look at my uh, you know job search folder in my my pc you can see i, I applied for 
30 plus universities or um, more than that uh, universities you can see that all those folders and you know that how as a researcher as a postdoc you know that how difficult is each job application in the academia you have to make a package like uh, your research statement uh, recommendation letters your publications ready and uh, things like that so each one is a package so i applied for several universities here i only got uh, two uh, interviews uh, that's it two in two initial interviews so at that time i realized that you know academia is not going to work for me so then I started exploring outside the academia. So you all might have came across this email that unfortunately at this time kind of emails. So I got that emails after emails after emails. Um, so finally, one person in my network, he offered me a job. So what happened is I neither me nor him aware of this H1B cap exempt. How, what is it different from the H1B before the industry? So we were both excited. Uh, we started working on our paperwork. I put a, uh, you know, resignation letter uh, at my, I talked with my advisor and I put in a resignation letter at my current university. So she, she is also uh, excited that I'm getting a job. So things were like, uh, uh, we were very happy, so happy. Uh, so at that time, uh, the attorney told me that then you cannot use your H-1B cap exempt for a for-profit company. So we were like, again, this is this was my uh, one of the you know narrow escapes I was mentioning there. We were like, uh, you know, there is no way. I still remember that I and my wife we went down a, um, you know, we were living in the Montre close to beach. We went there and uh, we we kind of crying like what we will do next you know you got a great opportunity but still you cannot work just because of your visa category just because you are an immigrant um you know so now i'm kind of nowhere i lost my job in the university where i was working as a uh, you know research scientist but at the time uh, i i'm not able to end up in this new job because of my visa problem so that's when the same professor who told me about this uh his poster who got the the brazilian person who got uh, a eb2 the same professor i he told me there is another category of visa then it is known as the o1 visa can you try that so i talked so this is very funny thing so all this time my attorney know that i'm struggling i'm going through that and he is an attorney, immigrant attorney. He didn't advise me on this oven. A layman who don't know anything about the immigration process, he told me that uh, there is a visa like oven. So I contact the attorney back and told him there is an oven visa. Do you know anything about that? Then he told me, yeah, I know there is an oven visa and you can definitely get that oven visa. So this oven visa processing is fortunately very similar to the EB1 that uh, documents and everything what you want to uh, want is very similar to the EB1. So I had everything ready. I ready it for the EB1. So I used that same uh, paperwork, same material. I added a few extra recommendation letters. Then I put that in the applied for Owen visa in the winter of 2019. And the same time I approved within 15 days, I got this uh visa approval so this is something i want to take from this slide so if any of you are in the same situation you are you know currently uh you know when i check the priority date for filing the i-485 is january 2021 so any of you in situation like this if you can convince your potential employer that there is an oven and there is a chance that you, a great big chance it's not like the h1b you will have a very great chance about uh, 80 percentage or 90 percentage are getting approved all the oven visa applications so if you can convince your potential employer that i have the i have a chance a great chance to get an oven so uh, if the uh, industry people they are ready to take you this is the path for you you really don't want to wait all the way for the for your priority date becomes uh, available so that you can uh, apply for the i485 this is a shortcut. Go for this. So, um, so this is uh, 
uh, my last slide here. So uh, I talk with many of the PhDs. So people are kind of reluctant uh, to move into industry or they don't know how to move into industry. So I also felt the same thing when I, you know, what kept me in academia, if you ask me that, you know, I felt like I, I lose my identity outside academia. I have my publications. I work in a kind of uh, an ivory tower, I would say, like uh, um, your own place, your own things and uh, your own room, things like that. And my citations. Uh, so what others will think if I move from uh, as a scientist to a industry job. So what others will think about that. So these are the things that kept me in the academia. Um, so, but I broke, uh, you know, the, the situation came that uh, I felt like there is, as I told, there is no way I'm going to grow in the academia. I will be in this uh, postdoc research scientist cycle. I'm not going to break that circle. So, uh, so that, uh, you know, pushed me or that uh, gave me the motivation to move into the academia. And one thing I want to tell you is that only thing that works in the uh, industry is the network, networking. So do the networking whichever way. I know it is tough. It was tough for me, if, especially, you know, I am not a kind of a person who go first and talk to others. So it was very difficult for me in the beginning, uh, but I started doing it and slowly, slowly, I'm still learning the uh, how I can do this networking. Uh, so if you look at my, I got four jobs in the industry in this uh, few years. Um, so uh, I got all out of these four jobs, all the three uh, came through my connections. I talked to people, I will tell them that I lost my job I, or I am looking for another job, things like that then I will make contact with them, talk to them. So that's how I got my job. So if you want to make this move, you want to do this. You want to make more connections in your ne network, in your industry, and uh, convince them how good you are. Uh, you know, PhD is a highly valued industry. That's what I noticed. If you work in among other, uh, you know, PhD people, they will not, they will not appreciate your work. So that also I noticed. This is just like if you may, if you analyze a huge volume of data and made a a publication, um, they will consider this another publication. But if you analyze a uh, few hundreds or a few thousands of data points and you bring something new out of that, the industry people they will appreciate it. They will uh, tell you that this is a great work and this values the company. So, uh, so I have noticed that difference in the industry versus the academia. But uh, what we want to do to break into the uh, industry, I already told one thing, connections. And second thing is that you really need to do a total remodeling of your resume. One tip I want to give you is that no one cares your publications in the uh, academia, unless otherwise you are going to a research scientist position. If you're, for example, I, I, I moved to a uh, data analysis or data science kind of position, but for that, only they think, think about your capability, how you can solve the problems. So another thing you want to do is that you want, you know, in the universities, we won't use many of the technologies that is used in the industry, like uh, Git. Uh, another one for the data side, SQL. There's not that much use, I haven't seen. And uh, if you are, I was a MATLAB user in the uh, university, but I moved to Python uh, starting from 2016. So, you know, nobody is using, not many of the companies using MATLAB because it's a lot, a lot of money involved with that. Python is free. It will do everything that MATLAB does, but free of cost. So, and another thing is that, you know, industry is looking for the problem solvers. But in the research, what we do is that we will take a problem and we go all the way to the end. Even minute details are important when you write a publication, but that's not the case in the uh, industry. They need problem solvers who will make some quick and dirty solutions. Once you have quick and dirty solutions, then iteratively you, you rebuild on that. You will make it more and more effective. So uh, if you get a problem, solve it quickly and make sure that uh, uh, your problem is solved and the customers are happy and your manager uh, likes it. And the same thing with when you write uh, CVs and resumes for the industry. 
you want to show that you are a problem solver. You pro solve this problem, and because of you probably solve problem, you saved this much time or you saved this much money, uh, things like that. So that's where you want to make your resume. Um, so these are the some things I wanted to share with you, and uh, uh, it's time for Q and A. Awesome. This is great, Denny. And I love the fact that you've used GIFs because GIFs are one of my favorite things to use. That with means. Uh, so thank you again for this robust understanding of like your entire journey. And uh, what I'd request you to is, can you stay like now since we are kicking off the Q and A at 12:40, we'd want mm -hmm. the half hour. Can you stay for another 10 minutes beyond? Yes. One? Okay, awesome. All right, folks, this is your opportunity to get one-on-one -on -one screen time with uh, Denny. What I would say is you there are what uh, 20 people here. We want to make sure everybody gets equal opportunity to ask Denny. So please keep your questions to one per person. No follow ups and we're going to go down the list after everybody has had an opportunity. If there is still time, we'll take your question. Okay, so please honor that. Mughala, go for it. Hey, um, hey, Danny. Uh, nice to Hi. meet you. Uh, so nice I you. Uh, do also work as a, a data scientist, uh, mm -hmm. but in a manufacturing space. I, but I do not have it. Uh, you know, I'm not from a researcher or a PhD background. So what would you suggest from the from a high level of what you've seen or, or from your experience? Yeah, these days are several of uh, software engineers and data science, especially the people who work in the cutting edge uh, uh, data science field. They are also getting the EB1, uh, a national interest waiver category. So, so several people will tell, "Don't make a profile. Your profile will work for you." But that is not the case. So, if you want, if you are thinking like, if you are going through the EB1A category, you go to uh, USGS website or any other attorney website. There will you see that what are the criteria used by the USGS to rank you go through that criteria and see that which of them you can meet we need three criteria minimum out of this 10 so look at that which of which one of them are going to help you for example if you are a data scientist some in some companies you will get the opportunity to present your work so take that opportunity you make a, a presentation go to the conferences present that and if you can you know if it is a good result if you can publish that somewhere, you, you can publish that. That is one thing. And second thing is, uh, is that, you know, uh, if you are a data scientist and if you are working really uh, well in your field, there is a chance that you will be uh, get offered some positions uh, in some of the organizations related to the data science and computer science. So look at that possibility. And third thing is that, you know, if you have published, ever published in IEEE or something like that, then contact them, tell them that I want to review some of your uh, publications. So that will help. And another way you can do is that if you are a uh, high income, if your salary is really high, that will count as another, uh, uh, you know, criteria. So go through your, uh, you know, that 10 criteria categories and look at that which is more accessible to you and build your profile based on that you know you really need to build your profile so that's what i see you know you have to make some targeted profiles of course you you will be having already have some criteria met but some criteria you have to build uh, based on that criteria thanks Danny. thank you Awesome. Uh, Bhau Saheb, go for it. Uh, thank you, Aditya, and thank you, Danny, for really uh, kind of like enlightening talk. Uh, I'm th I'm uh, and thank you for like highlighting this uh, option of like O1. Uh, mm -hmm. And my question is like, when you apply for any job, uh, I, currently I'm on a J1 visa, and mm -hmm. whenever you select, whenever they ask you like, wh what is your visa status? And like whether you need sponsorship or not, and when you said that yes, I need sponsorship, then you never never hear back from them. So is there any way around to the around that, or uh, maybe anything you can say on that? It'll it, it will be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that is a good question. You know, we uh, we all or most of the people who right now in the EB one 
or the green card might have went through this same uh, situation uh, sometime or other in their life. Um, so there is no work around for that. Uh, so only thing, uh, you know, right, right now you are on the J1. So, uh, you know, since you do not have a J1 waiver yet, there is no other option for you because you really want to go back to uh, India for your uh, or whichever is your home country. You have to go there and stay for two years before uh, coming back. So that's what I said. You have to uh, plan your uh, even H-1B cap exempt. You will not get without a J-1 waiver. So yeah, think I have about, plan for waiver uh, third stage. Yeah. Is in US, yeah. yeah. So if you have a J-1 going to get your J-1 waiver. So what is your next best option is a H-1B cap exempt. That is okay. your next best option. So I will suggest you that if you can get some university. So this way, what you are doing is that you are buying some time. So, uh, so that way you get your H-1B a cap exempt, which does not have any, uh, you know, home country going back criteria or there is no cap how many years you can stay in the United States. So once you are in the H1B cap, cap exempt, you can continue here for how many years, however time, you know, years you want. Uh, that way uh, you can apply for your EB1, O1, etc. So that is the uh, big option I'm going to see you. I'm, I'm seeing your next path forward. Uh, because uh, even if you get the H-1B, uh, sorry, and J-1, uh, you know, waiver, but still uh, what happens is that no one is going to sponsor you for the H-1B in the industry. Then right. second one is the O-1. Then your next option is the O-1. But the problem with the O-1 is that O-1 will take a lot of time for you to make the materials required for the O-1. Uh, the oven is the same type of material or same amount of materials you required for the EB1. So uh, if you have an oven package, you can use the same oven package for the EB1 and vice versa. If you have an EB1 package, you can use the same EB1 package for the oven uh, application. But the problem it, for me, it was about this thick, the total number of packages. This right. many things, yeah. So it will take time to build all those materials. So time is against you. So if you can make that much materials within the specified time, you are really good. You can talk with any of your connections. It is not the direct uh, job application that will not work. Mm -hmm. So talk to your connections. If there is any connections, tell, convince them that you have an open option. I can take an open option. So they usually. If the company is good, they will sponsor you the oven. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Ina. Ina and then Karthik. Hi, uh, thank you for such a nice presentation. And mm -hmm. um, so I am uh, doing my postdoc uh, and my, I will complete my third year of J1 in July. And mm -hmm. then um, my current postdoc project will end in September, on September 17th. So I'm looking for next postdoc positions. And mm -hmm. um, so I have given some interview, most probably means I will get selected in one. Uh, and so my question is whether I should ask my new employer to extend my J1 and then I should start applying for O1 in fifth year or I should ask them to support my O1 application from this fourth year only. I have good publications and citations. I have not reviewed much papers, but I can review by September. OK, um, so how about your J1 waiver? Uh, we think you do not have the J1 waiver, right? Started anything with waiver, yes. OK, yeah, so that means you uh, for the O1 also, uh, I, you need to get this waiver first. Oh, so, OK. Yeah, so you are uh, once you are on the J1, if you want to move to any other category of the uh, visa, that's what my understanding. Uh, uh, you you want to get a waiver. So I this heard, uh, I heard actually for Owen we don't need waiver. Yeah, I think we don't need waiver for Owen. Okay, so that my uh, uh, wrong understanding there. So if you can get the Owen, then there is nothing wrong uh, that you can try the Owen. Okay. Uh, whichever works for you that's all um, 
that's the best you know if j1 if the, they are going to give you a j1 that's the best if you are going to get o1 that is also good uh, since you got the j1 waiver uh, and if you can continue on the j1 that that's the best thing but um, i don't know whether you can get a j1 in my understanding you cannot get a j1 once you get the waiver j1 waiver yeah uh, so so the problem is in that condition your best option is to move into the o1 okay uh, yeah uh, but I, so if that is the case can you um, explain that you are on the o1 um, you you have in a j1 waiver yet um, so what will be you will be continuing on the o1 for next uh, next few se several years right yes. then yes. Yeah, okay, then you apply for the uh, EB1 or green card. You need J1 waiver at that time. Okay, so while on O1, I can apply for waiver. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea, I okay, think. So best option will be to uh, request my new employer for O1. And yes, O1. Okay. okay. And, and if it is in a university, yeah, you cannot go for the H1. The H1B require this uh, J1 waiver. That's what I understand it. Okay, okay. And if they uh, suppose they don't agree for O1 for the first year, just they want to see my performance. So is mm -hmm. it okay to just continue J1 for next fourth year and uh, then ask them for uh, supporting O1 application? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. It's it's always good to move away from the J1. That's my uh, point here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Continuing the J1, uh, it's a not a good idea uh, okay. because of this waiver situation as well as you know um, once you apply for the waiver you cannot go back to india things like that so okay. um, it is always move away from the j1 j1 is is a, if you are if you if you are going to stay here just for two years or four years maximum four years yeah. then j1 is good but if you are if your plan is to if your if your plan is long term yeah then definitely j1 is not a good visa category okay Thank you. Awesome. Um, so we should say that um, none of us are immigration lawyers, barring Poonam Gupta. But there was uh, we are we are telling you what we know. Just like ChatGPT, it was updated September 2022. Some of our brains have also been updated that way. Um, so Denny is telling you to the best of his ability. It's you're always welcome to consult a lawyer. Um, like Poonam has said, and I've also included in the chat, uh, J foreign residency requirements are being updated. And the reason why I know this is you can go to USCIS's website and you can sign up for their weekly updates. Okay. So it's in your best interest, everybody's best, in best interest um, to go to the USCIS website and sign up for these updates. It's scary to get a weekly email from USCIS. Uh, USCIS, like you're like, oh my gosh, what has happened? It happens to me too. I'm like, did I do something <laughs> for my green card? Um, but but these these updates are very, very important. So please sign up for them. Okay, okay moving on. Karthik Kashya. Very useful information. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, uh, thanks, Danny, for the talk and also congratulations on getting your green card. And uh, yeah. so uh, my question is from the journey which you just described. So starting from the papers and uh, citations, so just a small part. So basically, how many papers or like uh, what type of quality might be necessary for papers and how many citations will be good? And uh, there, so once I get my I-140 approved, that will be the point where I can sit and okay, uh, do other things like uh, H-1B exempt and J-1 and wait for some time to get my uh, other process done. Like for you, it took two years because of the uh, waiting time. And uh, my last question is that, uh, that O-1 requirement. So do I need a employer every time when I am on a O-1 visa? Uh, be in us or or yeah that's it uh yes yeah i will start from the uh last question for the oven you need a sponsor for the researchers uh you always need a uh, there are two category ovens that what i remember that is one is for the artist uh, and uh, um you know independent uh, um actors people like that 
so that that is another one or one category i think uh, they really don't require a sponsor this again you want to check it with but for uh, other category you really want a you know for people like us we really want a uh, sponsor uh, all the time we cannot be an independent we cannot independently apply for our own visa uh, there is there should be a sponsor for that then okay. what else you asked um, uh, can you can i know on which category you are right now on which visa uh, so i am currently a phd student so i am on f1 visa right now so okay yeah so i'm working on my building my profile getting some papers mm -hmm. yeah yeah so um you know when i got denied i had about uh, uh i had 26 publications and uh, uh 300 uh, plus citations so that is when i my first uh, filing got denied so again this depends on um, you know what kind of publications you made for example if you have a publication in nature uh, that uh, really impacts the uh, life of the people or something, uh, you know, some some e EB1, uh, sorry, some some kind of a highly influential paper or some highly influential research. Example, you did a research on black holes that uh, changed all our understanding of the black holes, something like that. That got published in several several news outlets. Uh, you know, interested in that story, and they published uh, several articles about that. You went and gave a lot of, uh, you know, um, talks in highly, for example, TED talks and things like that in highly um, influential field places. Then uh, you really want only maybe a couple of pu publications. Uh, but if you are in the field like me, I was working in the atmospheric science. In the atmospheric science, it was a boundary layer field so it was a narrow field uh, there is not much uh, happening in the atmospheric boundary layer on a daily basis uh, mm -hmm. even the weather is happening in the atmospheric boundary layer there is not much uh, uh, breakthrough inventions you cannot make in the boundary layer so because of that uh, i think uh, that was um, one reason my my application got rejected so it again depends on in which field you are working and uh, how much impact it made uh, for example, if you are in the cancer research and you developed a new drug, then you are good. You can you 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 have, require only one publication might be. Uh, okay. But you know, if the, your field is like me, then you really need more publications and uh, more citations. Okay, yeah, that clears my doubt. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Uh, Swapnil. Hi, Denny, uh, uh, for such a nice talk. And hi, Aditi, for organizing this. Uh, I have a question for open for everyone. So I would like to know what's the current uh, backlog for Indian visas, sorry, uh, Indian passports for uh, EB1. Yeah, for the EB1, if I remember correctly, it is about 2.5 uh, years. Uh, that's the current backlog. When I checked it today, let me see. Uh, it's, uh, I think it is in the um, January 2021. Uh, that is the um, you know priority date. So if your priority date is on or before 01 January 2021, that is you got the approval for your I-140 then you can apply for i-485 file your i-485 for the adjustment of status but if your priority date is after 01 january 2021 then you have to wait till you know this visa bulletin publishes the uh, new dates okay thank you so much all right shyam Deo, last question Hi, Danny. Uh, thanks a lot for all the insights. Yeah, Mike. Uh, so I'm currently also on uh, H1 CAP exempt. Uh, mm -hmm. I had been like, uh, that's the backup. Uh, the plan A was to get some position in academia, but given the situation, like so many factors at hand, I'm also looking for uh, industry positions. So I wanted to know like how things work out uh, for the O1, like you 
like the first thing is you apply for jobs like through connections etc and and how does the uh, how willing the industry folks are to sponsor this o1 visa is it uh, that common or is it similar to like sponsoring an h1 like are, are they willing even the willingness wise i really don't know how willing they are because i only worked with uh, one uh, company on the one visa so they have no idea just like um, uh, me um, they have no idea about uh, this one mm -hmm. visa uh, so uh, if uh, my suggestion is that uh, if you can find a job through mm -hmm. one of your connections mm -hmm. then if they are ready to take you then it is easy for you to convince them you know there is an o1 category that it is easy to get if you take the h1b versus o1 h1b mm -hmm. approval rate is about 20 percentage but for the o1 it is close to 90 or more than 90 percentage so there is if you have a very good profile that then there is really good chance that you can get the o1 so if you want to move into the industry and if you have a connection who is going to uh, support you for that then you can convince them you know don't go for the h1b i can get in another type of visa o1 and uh, that is going to uh, you know speed up the process as well mm -hmm. as there is a great chance for you to get the o1 um, so that is the methodology i uh, used okay and that's that's helps thanks a lot mm -hmm. Awesome, look at that. 1 p.m. and we're done with questions. Uh, I, I just want to reiterate that like what, what I picked up constantly from Denny's conversation is there is USCIS work and then there is the work that you do to build your profile. And then there is the invisible work that is convincing your employer, conv educating your employer. All of these things, is nobody talks about but that is like the number one thing that you will see come up again and again when you're going through this process um we have manasi sneak in a question but before we go to manasi we'll take the last question because we want to wrap up Denny, any any final words of advice for people what you want them to leave with from your uh, talk think about it think about it don't say it um, so let's uh, let's take Manasi's question. Oh, Kathy as well. Okay, all right. Let's keep Kathy and Manasi's question as a last two because we want to respect everybody's time. Uh, Manasi, go for it. Then Kathy, go for it. Hi, thank you, Aditi. Uh, thank you, Denny. It was really uh, nice to listen to your experience. Uh, so I'm Manasi. I'm actually a final year PhD student currently. So I, it's just intriguing for me to understand everybody how they're going through their like journeys of EB processes. So as Aditi mentioned that it is one of the things that you have to make sure to uh, make your employer understand how this process goes, goes on. Uh, as I'm looking for postdoc opportunities, I'm understanding a lot of people do not know that they can also sponsor H1B on a postdoc, like H1B cap exempt other than a J1. So uh, what I've learned so far is that it's no harm asking them if they would sponsor or not, uh, but a lot of people are not willing to do that. But if in case, what would you recommend? Like would J1 be better than an H1B or if H1B cap is available, you should go for that. If you can get the H1B cap exempt, go for that. Don't think about the J1. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. But that big, a lot of universities are just not willing to, I guess, like sponsor it for the fact that maybe it's more expensive. I'm not 100 percent sure what the mm -hmm. reasons are. Uh, I, I know other said no follow up questions, but since uh, this is like this is the last question that I had was like, is there like a cap as in like after five years of your J1? Would you automatically be if you're still a postdoc, would you automatically be on an H1B exempt or it's just something that you have to apply for? Yeah. No. You have to apply. No, you, you, yes. Let's see. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It makes sense. Awesome. Um, Kathy. Thank you, Aditi, for letting me chip in. I know we are over time. Uh, so I think I'm going to ask a quick question. I'm not sure it's even appropriate to ask for, but uh, would it be able to share uh, your package for uh, AB1? 
so I cannot share because that contains a lot of personal identifying information, and because of that, I cannot share that. Kyati, for you, uh, there are many EB1 petitions that are available online, but uh, I I did check when people file manually, but yeah, I I know when they, you use any attorney or somebody, they they have different pattern. I just wanna see if with attorney does it change anything. Yeah, I mean, um, when you file, asking for Denny's EB1 petition is like asking for somebody's dissertation. You know, it's <laughs> it's it's, yeah, it's yeah. you're gonna get overwhelmed. Uh, okay. And no, I know why you're asking for Denny's mm -hmm. uh, petition. Uh, what a better strategy would be to you can download all of these templates are out there. It's like a couple of hundred dollars. Download one and see, but looking for a petition versus building those building blocks of your profile is like looking for a container and not knowing what to put in the container right so first get those things ready what you need to put in the container and then it makes sense to look at the how it's going to be positioned no uh, i i was listening to several people saying yeah. that you need this much publication you need this much review you need to be editor of those those things i did everything yeah. And then I still talk to the um, petitioners, oh, sorry, attorneys. Uh, mm -hmm. Their um, answer to me is, my case is very good for EB1B, but they don't want to risk EB1A because I think it's depend on the field where you are applying from. Yeah, it's a, that's a standard answer. Yeah. But unfortunately, yeah. uh, for, for a lot of attorneys, they're going to encourage you to do EB2 and IW, and then they're going to go for EB1. And the only. No, they, they are not even saying EB1 and IW, they're saying EB1B, but not for EB1A. Yeah, that depends on if your yeah. employer wants to petition for you in EB1B, right? Yeah. So that's a separate yeah. question. And the, all these questions are getting into the nitty gritties, which is like particular to you. And those those are best suited for an attorney. And uh, I just hosted a LinkedIn post the other day asking people, how many attorneys did you go to? And uh, over 35% people said they went to five to 15 lawyers. Oh and my God. they are... <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why that is is because we are looking for whatever we can get for free, right? Like so, you, we go to five to ten lawyers, and hundred they all they are all free, and then you get like five free evaluations. Rather, picking a lawyer who charges you like a hundred fifty two hundred dollars of their time, making sure that they're doing the homework on you, right? That they have looked at your profile before and giving you meaningful feedback. That's uh, that's always a good strategy. And listen, there is, I don't know, I'm gonna send this Slack link to you as well. For anybody who's interested, there are over 41 people uh, who are, who have received their EB1s, including Denny is there. So reach out to those folks, see if uh, somebody can take up your, uh, like is willing to give their time of day for a couple of hundred dollars of their time. Um, look at your profile uh, and see what are those missing pieces, see how you are drafting your profile in a way that is evident to a lawyer what they want to see and then and then pivot that strategy accordingly is what would be my, my suggestion. Thank you. All right, Denny, the last question, what is that one piece of advice you want to give people and you want to leave them with as they're walking away from this session today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the answer to the uh, Kadi might be this uh, answer to this question. Um, so I I I had this answer before Kadi asked this question. Uh, you know, it is it is a different journey for different people. It is not this one uh, kind of uh, uh, you know. It's the same. It's not the same journey for everyone. Mm. For everyone, it is going to be a unique journey. Mm. But there is, there will be, or there is always elements that you can um, find in others' journey that matches with your journey. Mm. But it is a unique journey for you. So you have to walk that journey yourself, and be patient, and uh, be resilient, and. Uh, 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 learn how to manage your emotional roller coaster or your timeline. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you again, Denny, for for all your time and expertise. I'll uh, 
for folks who have paid for the recording, you're going to get it immediately. But for others, uh, I'm going to send it to you in a couple of uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, but thank you again, Denny, for, for everything. And uh, congratulations to all of you for making time on a Saturday. These events are never comfortable. Because now you're like, oh my gosh, I have so much work to do. You might be feeling angry that my this nationality colleague doesn't have to do anything and they're going to get their green card in one year. And look at how much we have to do just because we're born in India. It, all of these things are going to come to you. Um, and then people are going to tell you that, oh, you're choosing to do this on yourself. You can always pack your bags and go home. Um, but it's a lonely journey. But know that other people have also done this lonely journey. And the least we can do is do it together. So congratulations on taking that first step today. And again, thank you so much, Danny, for your wise words and counsel. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Thank you so much. You are doing such a great job. I hope, I wish I had uh, know someone like you when I started working on this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that might have helped uh, my work a lot better. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Danny. Take care, everybody. Bye.